Hello, I'm Faye Jensen, the CEO of the South Carolina Historical Society. Welcome to the first of our 2023 lecture series. In this series, we will be focusing on the coming of the American Revolution, both in and out of South Carolina. We will be switching to the original video of our talk in a few minutes. We had some technical difficulty recording the first bit of the presentation, so I'm going to catch you up on what was not recorded. First, let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Serena Zabin is Professor of History and Chair of the History Department at Carleton College. She is also President of the Society of the History of the Early American Republic. Professor Zabin earned her PhD in history at Rutgers University. She joined the faculty of the history department at Carleton in 2000. Her other administrative experience includes directing the Carleton program in American studies and serving as the Broom Fellow for public scholarship. Professor Zabin is the author of the Boston Massacre, a family history, which was named as an Amazon editor's choice for history in 2020. She has also written numerous essays and articles and two other books about early America. They are Dangerous Economies, Status and Commerce in, in Imperial New York, which was published in 2009, and the New York Conspiracy Trials of 1741, Daniel Horsmanden's Journal of the Proceedings, published in 2004. Professor Zabin is also the co-designer of a video game Witness to the Revolution, currently under development. So, Dr. Zabin began her talk by reminding viewers that the Seven Years' War, which ended in 1763, gave the British dominance in North America, but it also brought trouble with the colonists. It was an expensive war and the British began to impose taxes to cover those expenses. This led to increased resentment which in turn led to an effort by the British to expand their imperial authority. As this resentment grew, governors like the governor of Massachusetts requested that the British send troops across the Atlantic. Dr. Sabin noted that British soldiers were frequently sent to the colonies and even to Ireland to act as po a police force. They disliked that part of their job, but that was one reason that they were called in. Dr. Zabin then explained that the Boston Massacre, which took place on March 5th, 1770, has been misrepresented and misinterpreted, mainly due to this one engraving by Paul Revere, which you'll see here when I share my screen. This image has been reproduced in hundreds of textbooks, and it was in fact a work of propaganda. It portrays mainly through this large line of smoke right here, a clear division between the British soldiers and the people of Boston. Dr. Zabin has found that there was no such clear line. The soldiers and the people of Boston were neighbors. They were friends, and in some cases, they were family. In her research, Dr. Zabin discovered that soldiers frequently brought their families with them on such assignments. So Boston saw a pretty large influx of British when the troops arrived with their wives and their children. Many of them were housed in barracks, but housing was in short supply. So others stayed in pubs and private homes. She showed a map of Boston, which indicated that they were housed throughout the town, not just in one location. She also said that there was a lot of interaction between the soldiers and the townspeople. Proof of that, or one, one item of proof of that, is that there were about 40 marriages in Boston churches between soldiers and local women during the time that the, the soldiers were stationed there. So now we will proceed with our original video. And colonies could not enjoy the liberty and power promised by the British victory in 1763. What lay in store for them? So just a few sort of 
um, thoughts about how these first acts set up the problem and the relationship between Britain and its colonies. So the British colonies, the British government, excuse me, passed a, a number of new laws in 64, 1764, that were intended to raise money. But the one that really caught the colonists' attention was one that was passed in 1765, famously the Stamp Act. So in Virginia, a new member of the House of Burgesses named Patrick Henry kicked off those protests in North America by delivering a fiery speech in which he objected to the act on the basis of principle, not its expense. And other colonies soon followed Virginia's lead. New York warned that if Parliament persisted in taxing the colonies, the results, they said, would be, here's a quote, to weaken that affection for the mother country, which this colony ever had and is extremely desirous of retaining. So notice that these protests are in the language of affection and family. But these written complaints were not enough to get Parliament's attention. So colonists turned to street theater and mass gatherings. And these mass events had two goals, to demonstrate to the ministry in London their unhappiness with the act and to compel more immediately and concretely the local stamp collectors in each colony to resign their posts. So the public protests achieved both of those goals. Up and down the Eastern seaboard, colonists held mock funerals for liberty, burned stamp collectors' effigies and enormous bonfires they gathered by the thousands. And that summer, in particular, Bostonians burned down the houses of the Stamp Act and the lieutenant governor. Crowds in other continental colonies followed their lead. So the Stamp Act protests were important because they took a shared political language and they injected it into everyday life. So in the same way that political theater pulled politics out of assemblies, congresses, and put them in the street, colonists participated in politics in their social world, right? So like an 18th, excuse me, an 18th century equivalent of like a car bumper sticker, right? Looks something like this, where colonists are drinking tea and coffee out of pots that say things like, you know, America, liberty restored on the one side and no stamp act on the other. In Pennsylvania, Men raised their mugs and dozens of toasts that included both the king, that was the first one, but also made the Stamp Act be buried in oblivion. In Virginia, men and women held balls, right, to celebrate the end of the Stamp Act. So even ladies who were otherwise excluded from politics were part of these events. And it worked. Parliament did repeal the Stamp Act. But it was still determined to find more revenue and for that matter, create more control, more centralization of its American colonies. So in 1767, parliament passes another series of import taxes, these named for the prime minister, whose name was Charles Townsend. Throughout the colonies, men and women decide to protest these taxes by boycotting the imports. And one of the surprising impacts of those boycotts by consumers was how explicitly they those boycotts invite women as well as men to be part of the political arguments. And it was unusual to invite free women to participate explicitly in colonial politics. Women were not allowed to vote even in New England's very broad-based town meetings, and it seems unlikely they ever tried. But boycotts turn citizens' economic choices into political acts. And in fact, just a little more on Boston, which yeah, is here. If you can read this, I, it's probably a little small for you. Um, but um, there's the Boston Post boy publishes this very scoldy poem, right? They call it Address to the Ladies. And so in an attempt to persuade women to support these new boycotts on English goods, towards the end, you can see the author of this terrible doggerel suggests that homemade cloth has its own sex appeal. Young women who wanted to attract interest just need to follow the instructions of the town meeting. So the poet ends, do without fear and to all you'll appear fair, charming, true, lovely, and clever. Though the tar times remain darkish, young men may be sparkish and love you much stronger than ever. Just terrible poetry. But this appeal to young women who are eager to meet and marry a man with 
obviously blatant, right? It promised not only that homespun would make a woman look more gorgeous, right? So this is to say, um, I should have mentioned the boy, one of the major boycotts was um, for cloth, right? So um, stuff that people were actually spinning and weaving on their own was going to make a woman more attractive. But also this poem promises that in these unsettled political times, marriage was deeply political. I think that matters. So non-consumption movements are quite successful, actually, in bringing free women into the protest movement. So in North Carolina, women gathered to sign other non-consumption agreements. They're mocked mercilessly. Um, but non-importation in the colonies extended well beyond consumer goods. Um, and although I'm not going to talk much about South Carolina, one of the things that is really interesting that comes out of these non-importation movements um, in the South is in the Carolinas, including South Carolina and in Virginia, um, colonists decide to ban slave cargoes. And in South Carolina, the international slave trade came to a complete standstill in 1769 and 1770. So this decision to end the slave trade by white colonists who support the non-importation ban is based on what I think is a kind of murky combination of politics, economics, and principle, which I'm happy to talk about more later if you're interested. Um, but overall, Parliament is not pleased with these um, boycotts. It hurts local merchants, London merchants. So, And they respond by playing hardball. They decide that um, to collect those new taxes more efficiently, they're going to reorganize the custom service and put its headquarters in Boston. So unsurprisingly, in Boston, there are riots against both the custom duties and the people who are supposed to collect them. And because that was the head of the new customs office, those riots seemed particularly distressing to imperial officials. So in 1768, after a particularly enormous protest, the governor of Massachusetts decides he needed some backup. And to do the backup he wanted were troops to help keep order in Boston. So here, there's three things that you should know about the 18th century British army as we think about these troops. So first, the whole idea that there should even be an army in peacetime what was known as a standing army, seemed really wrong to most Bostonians. The general idea was that the government really shouldn't have an army that it could turn on its citizens. In fact, Britain did have a peacetime force, although everyone was very clear that it was subject to civilian authority. And then this brings me to my second point. Governors and magistrates often asked the war office to send them troops to use as a police force. And this was as true in England as it was in the colonies. All over England, smugglers tried to evade import taxes and local magistrates tried to catch them at it. In fact, that same year that the governor of Massachusetts asked for troops, the man who's in charge of distributing regiments all around the British Empire complained that so many magistrates had asked for troops to support customs officials and to suppress riots all over England that he was running out of regiments to hand out. So the British Empire is using troops as police all over the empire. And then here is the third thing that um, you really need to know about the 18th century British army. We often think of 18th century armies as parallel to contemporary ones in everything but equipment, but they were significantly different. You heard from the bit I read before, because 18th century armies traveled with women and children. Hundreds of military families flooded into Boston in 1768 and their presence in the town had an enormous impact on future events. So when the governor of Massachusetts said he needed troops to help support the work that he's doing for the British government, the war office says, okay, the war office was used to using troops to put down riots, shut down smuggling, and those were his two problems. So when the first two regiments sailed into Boston Harbor, here we are in the fall of 1768, the governor and his council were still squabbling about where those troops should be quartered. And these actually are coming 
from these, these are the ships that have um, the chambers on them, among others. So they're arguing about where all of these troops are going to live. Um, so let's just take a quick look at what Boston would look like. So this is what it looked like in 1769, right? And here it is with a modern map stretched over, um, sorry, underneath the, um, the old map. And so you can notice how much of the 18th century harbor has been filled in. And this part matters because of the fight over where those soldiers are going to live. Selectmen thought that, um, those, so those say the people who are running Boston thought that soldiers should live in refurbished barracks out on Castle Island, okay, in the middle of Boston Harbor. This is what Boston looked like from the barracks. It looks, as you can see, pretty far away. It's kind of small, right? Whereas meanwhile, the governor, this is how long it would take to get there. You can see uh, um, what the route would look like. Um, the the governor and the commanding officer wanted them in that little red box, right, right in the heart of Boston, so that they could actually control the riots. But this is the problem. The 18th Century Quartering Act, one had just been updated in 17, um, in as part of the 1760s, um, 1765, um, 64, excuse me. But the 1764 Quartering Act was very clear that soldiers had to be housed first in existing barracks. If there were no barracks, then regiments went to public houses, pubs, right? And only if there were no barracks and no public houses could soldiers be put into private houses. And Boston had barracks right out there in Boston Harbor on Castle Island. They're actually very nice. Massachusetts had just refurbished them for the use of British troops during the Seven Years' War. But the problem is, as you saw, is that those barracks were four miles away, here we are again, from the center of Boston. And this put the governor and the commanding officers in a quandary. They wanted to use private property in the center of Boston, but, so, right, here it is again, um, but the selectmen warned them that the town officers would get them cashiered, kicked out of the army, for violating the Quartering Act if they tried to. So they come up with a compromise, a really interesting compromise. The army would not requisition private property. They would pay for it. So first, the army rented all of the available warehouses in the center of Boston. Those are the blue squares. And that simply wasn't enough room for all of those soldiers and their families. So the army also had to hire private houses, rooms in private houses, even outbuildings to house the overflow. And as a result, the troops and the townspeople of Boston found themselves living literally together, right? So the army ends up turning Bostonians into landlords. So this map of Boston that shows the homes of all the soldiers demonstrates clearly how completely soldiers' families moved into the streets of Boston. So instead of being isolated in a small circle near the town center, as they'd hoped, as the officers had hoped, soldiers and their families also lived in the rooms and yards of Bostonians in every part of town. When some 2,000 members of the army, because that's what four regiments looks like, moved into a city that was only 16,000 residents in total, you can imagine they sometimes found each other a little annoying. Men like Revere, who were part of the Sons of Liberty, those political groups that started as a result of the previous protests, definitely saw the presence of troops as a military occupation. He and the other men walking through Boston at night were really annoyed that the soldiers, that soldiers stopped them in the streets. Meanwhile, the constables who made up the Boston Watch found themselves the brunt of some pretty abusive language from drunken officers. But I think their complaints are not the only way to think about troops in Boston. Instead, I'd like to suggest that we think of a very different place when we think about the term garrison town. Take a moment to call to mind, for those of you who remember it, Maryton in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Think of the excitement that having a regiment quartered a few miles away created for that family at Longbourn. Fathers might be anxious, but young women were delighted. So think of Lydia Bennett imagining herself at a regimental encampment, right? 
um, like this one, which is in London. And as Austin said, thinking of Lydia, she saw all the glories of the camp, its tents stretched forth in beauteous uniformity of lines, crowded with the young and the gay, dazzling with scarlet. And to complete the view, she saw herself seated beneath a tent, tenderly flirting with at least six officers at once. So the soldiers that beguile the young women of Meryton a little later during the Napoleonic Wars were not so different from those red-coated men who caught the eye of Boston's young women in the years before the American Revolution. The arrival of regiments in Boston in 1768 was just as exciting to those local women. The arrival of nearly 2,000 men, many of them young and single, all of them with a steady, if very small income, could not help but attract the attention of young women. With so many young men frequenting taverns, strolling the streets, dropping by a neighbor's kitchen, an unmarried woman might well be able to find a husband, possibly one even living in her family's spare room. It's my favorite image of all, because who knew that doing laundry could be so fun? Like Lydia's father, Mr. Bennett, some men found it impossible to control their female dependents in the face of so many red coats. So here, um, I'm going to read to you just one of my favorite stories, and I think I'll stop with the reading. But this one, because it gives you a little flavor of what it was like to live in Boston in these years, and also because um, this is really one of my favorite stories. Um, all the research I did from a chapter that I called Love Your Neighbor. Uh, but I'll skip through a little bit. But um, this is about a private named William Clark. So William Clark, while his comrades in the 29th Regiment were trying to find their housing, William Clark was spending his time with literature, his own. Two months after his arrival in Boston, Clark announced that his play, The Miser, or The Soldier's Humor, a comedy of three acts was available by purchase, uh, sorry, for purchase by subscription. The broadside announcing the subscription included a brief and nearly correct Latin tag, non posent placato omnibus. I can't please everyone. Presumably, Clark did acquire enough subscriptions to publish his play since the following February it was advertised. Sadly, no copies remain for us to read today. Russell may not have printed many. The short run was likely read until it fell apart, and then, like many cheaply printed pamphlets, we used as toilet paper. Such a fate might have been particularly appealing to some Bostonians. In the winter of 1769, not many residents were likely eager to read about the soldier's humor. But Private William Clark seemed to have a flair for drama off the page as well. In May of 1769, he had a shouting match with the Boston Watch. When stopped on the street, he threatened to burn down the town workhouse and all of Boston with it. As the watchman arrested him and brought him to the local lockup, Clark swore he'd have his revenge on the entire town. It took Clark only a month to stage an even more melodramatic scene with Boston locals. One June day in 1769, 75-year-old Joseph Lazenby was shocked upon entering his married daughter's house to find Clark in bed with his 20-year-old granddaughter, Mary Nowell. The elderly son of liberty ordered Clark out of the house, but the insouciant soldier refused to leave. He had every right to sleep with Mary, Clark asserted. After all, she was his wife, he told the astonished old man, and he was going nowhere without her. Clark may have been stretching the truth a bit. Mary said they had been married one evening by a person who was dressed as a priest. In fact, they were not married until four months after being caught in flagrante. So devastated, but, oh, excuse me, married they were, in fact, much to the distress of Mary's parents, but so devastated were they, the paper claimed, that the news of the affair much impaired their health. Two weeks after the marriage, Mary's father had a showdown with his new son-in-law. Clark shoved a loaded pistol into Joseph Nowell's chest. Joseph pressed charges. And after many adjournments in April 1770, Clark found himself in jail until he could pay a 40 shilling fine. William Clark's marriage meant more than family scandal. It became political fodder 
for Boston's Sons of Liberty. In fact, the story of Joseph Lazenby finding Clark in his granddaughter's bed was, rep was reported in newspapers sympathetic to the Liberty Party. Nodding to a sense of propriety, especially about sexual matters, the press usually replaced many personal names in its stories with dashes. But Bostonians obviously knew something of the Clark story before it was printed. When the shopkeeper, Harbottle Door, read the account in the Boston Evening Post, he carefully annotated the article, recording that the young woman in question was Mary Nowell and her grandfather, Mr. Lazenby. Boston's newspapers rarely printed accounts of sexual scandal for their salacious details alone. The Journal of the Times used the story to point out the political implications of this illicit marriage, urging its readers to reflect on the inevitable impact of troops on Boston's families, that the most dear and tender connections, they said, must be broken and violated. The ultimate blame for the seduction, the article concluded, must fall on imperial officials who have been the authors of these scenes of public and private distress. The old man stumbling in on his favorite granddaughter was only the preface to the primary protest, which is the quartering of a standing army in times of peace. The author argued that in the world of occupied Boston, public and private affairs of the heart were one and the same. Now, to be honest, it's unlikely that Clark thought of his seduction in terms of politics. He spent his time in prison imagining his next literary work. In August of 1770, he took out another advertisement, this one for his new memoir, a true and faithful narrative of the love intrigues of the author William Clark, soldier to his majesty's 29th regiment of foot. And actually that's only the beginning of this extensive title. Clark's love intrigues exposed an 18th century soap opera, complete with cameo appearances by various Sons of Liberty and British Army officers in settings ranging from prisons to bedrooms. He clearly meant the 60-page narrative to be a tell-all and maybe also a means of revenge because he targets his in-laws. Unlike newspapers, Clark named names. The long title of his memoir concludes with these words, in which is given a faithful account of his courtship, marriage, and betting with Mary Nowell, daughter of Joseph Nowell, boat builder at North End Boston, with a description of how much he suffered on said account. The memoir has not survived, so we can only imagine how Clark might have told his version of being found in bed by his lover's grandfather. We can assume from the title and from its emphasis on Clark's suffering, that his version would depart from the story told by the Sons of Liberty. The villain of Clark's story is his father-in-law, called out by name. This flippant young man was not troubled by the politics of the British Empire and its impact on his wife's family or on her hometown. Instead, his was the age-old family of young lovers and disapproving parents. Um, I see that there's much love for Jane Austen, I go on in the book to talk about um, some further comparisons, but I'll stop there because there's so much, because he's such a blast. But let me just say that, in fact, um, besides Clark's, there are at least 40 marriages in Boston between soldiers and civilians in the, in the 17 months or so that the troops were stationed there. And there were hundreds of baptisms of soldiers' children in the local churches, often with Bostonians standing up as godparents. So many families, both real and fictive, that um, we see the connections that people were making in real life, right? Not just in these stories. Soldiers actually made families um, outside. They become parts of, of families and communities outside of Boston as well. And again, just like at the time, I'd be happy to talk more about um, families and soldiers who desert in the question and answer. But in short, soldiers and civilians were much more closely entwined than we realize in the 1770s. And then this brings us back to the Boston Massacre, because when Bostonians and soldiers, oh, I'll go back to that in a second, sorry. Go back and look at our picture. Um, when Bostonians and soldiers mingled on the streets, they knew each other, often very well. They didn't always like each other. But when that lone sentry in the center of town 
grew anxious at being hassled by a crowd of Bostonians one night in early March, he called for backup. And the backup that came, just a handful of soldiers, all knew at least some of the Bostonians who were in the street that night. One of the soldiers was a man named James Hardigan, who had himself recently married a Boston-born woman. Another was a man named Edward Montgomery, whose Irish wife, Isabella, had come to Boston with him and, in fact, with the Chambers a few months earlier. Isabella did not get along well with all her neighbors. Earlier that night, she apparently shouted loudly enough for people in the surrounding houses to hear that the town of Boston was too haughty and too proud and that many of their asses would be laid low before the morning. And the Bostonian Susanna Cathcart, clearly tired of both Isabella and her husband, shot back, I hope your husband will be killed. But not all Bostonians wished death on the Montgomerys. Also in the street that night was a carpenter named Thomas Wilkinson. For a few months, the Montgomerys had rented a home near Wilkinson and they'd become friendly. In the 18th century equivalent of running to a neighbor's house for sugar, sorry, lost my page here, um, they'd become quite friendly. And um, so sorry, lost my page. Um, uh, there. Um, they, it's certain. Sorry, in the 18th century equivalent of running to a neighbor's house for a cup of sugar, Wilkinson occasionally sent his children to Montgomery's home for coals to start his own, his own fire. So when Wilkinson saw Montgomery marching out to support the entry, he walked straight over to his former neighbor to ask what was happening. And of course, what was happening that night is a big question. We don't really know. All we know is someone yelled fire and soldiers fired. We don't know who shouted. We know when the smoke cleared, five Bostonians lay dead or dying on the ground. And when people looked around, they knew the soldiers and the civilians on the street. At the time, that event was shocking. Everyone was horrified. But nobody, absolutely nobody thought that this was the beginning of a revolution. Boston women continued to marry British soldiers. John Adams continued, <laughs> excuse me, agreed to take on the defense of the soldiers and the captain. And of course, two juries of Massachusetts men acquitted most of the soldiers. The importance of March 5th, 1770 is not the shooting itself, but how that shooting became transferred into the Boston Massacre, which happens through the retelling of these stories, in which both sides try to, they scramble to tell their version of the story. They try to blame the other side. And it's in the retelling of this story that leads people to forget that they once had a deeply intimate connection. And I'm guessing that any of you who've been through a breakup maybe can see where this is going. Because after the shooting, the troops were redeployed out of Boston. And we should think, what happened to these families when they're ripped apart? They're faced with choices, right? Um, men could stay, so after the shooting, um, if women chose to stay, married women, they could sort of self-divorce. If men chose to stay, they would desert the army. If women chose to leave with their husbands, they would travel with the British army as little shards of Boston embedded in the heart of the empire. It's the ripping apart of these families that's the most significant impact of the Boston massacre. So Quite briefly, right, and I'm going to I'm going to go really quick here. So we've got some time for questions. Street riots abate for a while after the Boston Massacre. Struggles between colonists and imperial officials really don't. Um, there are um, sets of protests over tea, um, which you probably um, know about in December of 73 under pressure from other ports. So if, sorry, I should start by saying in places like Charleston, where you all are, importers agree just not to sell tea. They, they agree to resign their commission um, in, in the face of these tea acts. But in Boston, um, merchants refuse to budge. And so um, a large group of men dress up kind of sloppily as Mohawks. They board three ships in Boston Harbor, throw cargoes of tea overboard. And Parliament escalates this conflict again by closing Boston Harbor until someone paid for the ruined tea. So by 1774, 
many colonists had had enough. And that next spring, when Massachusetts' new military governor decided to seize a cache of armaments that were rumored to be hidden out in the countryside, armed militias confronted the British army in both Lexington and Concord. Okay, so there's a lot more to the story, as you know. So, but I'm going to end here with one final family. So um, I have some time for questions. Okay, um, just the last minute. We sometimes call the American Revolution a civil war. By this, I think we mean a clash of citizens, a sort of struggle over the definition of a new country. But it would be no less accurate to call the revolution a family war because the conflict played out in the upheaval of innumerable families formed and split by military occupation. Every family wrestled with that conflict in its own way and every family was forced to make choices as difficult as they were inevitable. War, peacekeeping, political administration, they brought together civilians and soldiers, men and women, children and their godparents throughout the British Empire. And those same forces buffeted families as they moved around the Atlantic Rim and then sometimes tore them apart. In an 18th century Anglo-American world in which family and government were closely connected notions, that shooting in Boston marked not the beginning of the American Revolution, but the breakdown of a family. The language of family had long saturated British political discourse, but in the context of military families, it takes on new and personal meanings as we've seen. We think of the American Revolution as a political event, but it was much more like a bad divorce. This family history reminds us of the human bonds as well as the political ones that were broken at the beginning of the American Revolution. So our final story is about a woman named Hannah Flucker. Um, she's the wife of a wealthy loyalist. She's the mother of three daughters. And in a few years, she mar manages to successfully marry off all three of them, the eldest to a British lieutenant, um, the youngest one, Lucy, to Henry Knox, who will become a um, Continental Army general. Sally marries another British officer. By 1775, Lucy's new husband, Henry, was fighting the British Army at the Battle of Bunker Hill. When the British Army left Boston late in 1776, most of this family left with them. So only Lucy and Henry threw in their lot with the Continental Army. Those three sisters never saw each other again. And although Lucy repeatedly wrote to her mother, now traveling with the British army, first to Halifax then England, she never received a reply. As Lucy wrote in 1777 to her sister, Hannah, how horrid is this war, brother against brother and the parent against the child. The struggle between the mother country and her colonies was more than a figure of speech. The metaphor contained a genuine truth. The British empire of the 1770s was built on friendships and families and thousands of connections among British soldiers and civilians were part of what sustained that empire. And when families dissolve, when spouses separate, generations quarrel and allegiances break down, so do the larger structures they support. The physical intimacy of the occupation of Boston had created those families and friendships and their destruction is the cornerstone of America's founding. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Okay, let's see. If, um, let's see about a few questions here. I. Someone asked about uh, colonial taxes, saying they were relatively low, were they not? Yeah, so the argument about taxes um, really, you know, seems to us a little paranoid, right? Because um, that the amount of the tax itself is not ever enormous. And in fact, often when parliament set those taxes, they, um, you know, they deliberately set them relatively low in the hopes that that would mean people would actually pay them. Um, there are a couple of reasons though, why people, why 
call it as protest of the taxes. One is, um, in fact, sort of that philosophical problem of, you know, people saying, well, these aren't the taxes that we would have chosen. And especially, especially the problem is you're not collecting them in the way that works for us. Right. So for a long time, of course, the colonies paid taxes. They understood that was part of the deal. It wasn't a problem for them. But the way it worked is the governor would tell the legislature how much money they needed to send back. The legislature would send the tax, they would collect it, and it would get sent back. One of the big problems is the um, parliament starts saying, well, we actually only want that those taxes paid in silver, in hard money. Well, there's not a lot of hard money in the colonies. So they start saying, why can't we do it our way again, right? So the problem in some way is about how is the money actually going to be collected? Um, and sometimes the question really was, you know, how is it that you are deciding, you know, both how this money is going to be put together, but also on whom the taxes are going to be levied? I mean, what are the really things I've always thought was sort of stupid about the Stamp Act is that it falls most heavily on the most literate of all the colonists who are, you know, lawyers and, and people who print newspapers, right? <laughs> Excuse me, the people who are most able to protest, right? Um, and so it's not so much about the amount as the how. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, another question. What happened to those who were part of the Loyalist majority in 1763 who did not come over to the Patriot cause? Was their only option to immigrate to England? And did so, many of them do that? Yeah, and I, one of the pieces that I've been thinking about is um, those sisters at the end. I talked about the Flecker sisters um, because indeed um, they split up and part of what we see um, very dramatically are all of these loyalists fleeing Massachusetts um, for Halifax in 1776. Um, and many of them felt at that moment that they had no choice but to leave. Um, some of them come back within months <laughs> and they say, whoops, we made a mistake. Sorry. The entire town of Marshfield, Massachusetts, I think, you know, comes back. They're like, well, it's, it's not what we thought. It'll, we're, we're just returning. So some people who early on decide that that they want to throw in their lot with the army, you know, turn back. Um, you know, there are various moments when people decide, I'll go this far, but I won't go that far, right? Um, and so we know even people who um, who write major protests against some of these acts refuse to sign the Declaration of Independence. One of the really interesting things is many people who, uh, many people try to keep their heads down. And then many people who do leave just try to come back. And actually, there's wonderful work on South Carolina by Rebecca Brannon. I don't know if you've had her speak yet on the reintegration of the South Carolina loyalists um, who do overall manage to reintegrate in the 1780s. Many, many people just come home again. Interesting. A lot of questions here on the import boycotts. Um, how durable were the various elements of the import? Um, and what did they include beyond cloth, tea, and enslaved people? And how much did the success vary geographically? <laughs> yeah, all right. Those are big questions. Those are big um, questions. They're, they're big and, and important questions. So um, let's see. So the boycotts are both what we might call non-consumption and non-importation. I didn't take that much time to go through them, but... Um, you know, non-consumption where people are just choosing not to buy is overall much broader and honestly much, much better than non-importation where merchants are saying that they are going to refuse to import. There are so many holes in non-importation, right, um, that, you know, people are giving up. I mean, sometimes merchants all together just like fess up. They're like, this is not working. This is what happens in Philadelphia, you know. Um, sometimes people who are opposed to the um, boycotts to start publishing, you know, pu public handbills saying, actually, these people that you think are so virtuous, they're actually smuggling stuff and they're still importing. <laughs> so the non-importation has a lot of holes in it. It's amazing, actually, that the, um, that the slave trade really does shut down. That's the one place that really does seem as though... Um, 
um, as, as though the non-importation holds, which is partly because it, there seems to be some self-interest in that story as opposed to um, the non-importation of goods that, um, that doesn't feel like there's a glut in the market. Um, so sorry, there were a lot of pieces to those questions. Yeah, um, and um, the uh, difference, um, did, did it vary geographically, the success of it? Yes, it 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 did. As I said, it depended a little bit on where um on, on what what items were coming in, right? As I said, in the South, um, you know, the um non-importate at the end of the slave trade or the closing of the slave trade for that moment is very successful. Um Actually, tea seems to be shut down pretty well also in the South, much better than Philadelphia really has a hard time with the tea peas. Um, and, uh, but, but the kind of larger problem of what's going to be imported and exported um, and the boycotts on exports are, are pretty hard. Thinking about South Carolina, I think um, hard for South Carolinian merchants not to export rice. They yeah. really, they are, yeah. um, they're embedded in a world of um, kind of credit and debt and they just see everything collapsing, right? Um, yeah. In that moment. And they're, they don't really have a beef with the people to whom they're exporting rice, right? So, so for them, it doesn't always make sense. So it doesn't go, yeah. But you did say parliament noticed because they asked about was the, was the impact meaningful? The impact was meaningful. The merchants in London do um, start pushing Parliament to rethink some of these, um, you know, some of the taxes, right? And so, you know, it's most meaningful um, for the Stamp Act. It's um, it's less so further on, partly because it's just harder to see. Um, there are too many merchants with too many different fingers and too yeah. many pots. Yeah. Okay, time for, for a couple more, maybe? Sure. Um, what did the military presence look like in the colonies before any of the riots started? So there are troops um, that are in, um, in North America, you know, but not a ton before the Seven Years' War, right? So you have a few regiments that are there largely um, to kind of keep the French and Indian line in Canada, often around New York. Um, some uh, some few also further south, right? Um, looking at Florida, trying to keep the line in Florida. Um, but really it's the Seven Years' War that just sees this enormous deployment of soldiers, um, many of whom want to stay, right? Um, and as the army gets bigger and bigger, it also becomes a kind of welfare program for parliaments, um, you know, members of parliament for their like younger brothers, right? Who like <laughs> aren't going to inherit yeah. and can't have a seat. It's like, but, you know, we can get them, a, you know, um, we have to pay a little bit. That's how the army worked, but you can get them a commission. And so when the war ends, um, there's a lot of reluctance to completely disband the army, right? I mean, parliament sort of overall says, well, there should be a peace dividend. Of course, you know, we shouldn't have taxes that supporting the army at the same level, but they also don't want to get rid of all the officers and all those regiments. So what they do is they shrink the number of um, private soldiers in every regiment and they keep the number of officers. And so there's a lot of officers just kind of banging around North America, um, not doing much. Interesting. <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, okay. Uh, Devin said, you mentioned desertions. Can you speak to that issue? Yeah, just really quickly. I love this part. Um, so I hope I'll be quick. Um, it, one of the things that's sort of amazing about what happens in Boston is the rate of desertion is so high. So overall, when troops are in North America during the Seven Years' War, right, um, the rate of desertion is about 3%. Um, but in Massachusetts, it's about 20% in those four years. It's just enormous. And, um, and officers are going crazy. So they start hiring people, sort of spies, to try to find where these deserters are. 
And um, one of them, actually, we have the kind of spy report, which is fun. Um, he finds them there, you know, they've, they've gone out to New Hampshire or to the countryside. Um, they find work as farm laborers and they pretty much marry the farmer's daughter and they stay. That's fun. <laughs> Melinda says that you, you've given a great perspective on the social nature of Boston and British society and wanted to know, did you focus more on personal papers or other sources? I tried to go back and forth. The, the heart of the book really are the muster rolls where I found the names of sort of all 2000 guys who are in Boston. And it was through that that I figured out who married whom, who's in jail for what, right? Because after they're in Boston for a couple of months, the records stop identifying them as soldiers. They, they just say they're of Boston and that's which, or sometimes resident in Boston. So I needed to to work through those administrative records. And then after that, I did, I found everything I could. That is terrific. Um, the last question was, where could they find your books? And our Virginia Ellison answered and gave them a link to your books on Amazon. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, indeed. They're available by ebook. I think the paper is coming out for the uh, anniversary of March 5th. Terrific. That's great. Well, this was really enjoyable, Dr. Zabin. We, we, we really learned a lot from you and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you um, for having me. And we also appreciate everyone who attended. I hope you'll go to our website at schistory.org to, set, set, um, to check out the programs that are, that are going to be coming in the future. And if you're not already, I hope you'll support the SCHS by becoming a member. Everyone take care and have a good evening. Good night.